Good morning. Uh, it's only for uh, public school teachers that 9 a.m. start time is considered, allows you to sleep in. Uh, so welcome. Um, uh, our household for years was dominated by my wife's 6.30 departure for, uh, for the school where she was teaching. Uh, I'm, I have the misfortune actually to come last here where um, I feel like I should just stand down and sign up for one of the seminars. In fact, <laughs> maybe even all of the seminars I've heard about, but uh, I think uh, Jim would say I have to soldier on. So, uh, so here we go. Um, my name is David Engerman. I arrived at, la uh, at Yale last year after teaching for 20 years in Boston at Brandeis University. Um, and uh, if I take Ian's comment that a person has to change job 15 times over a career, I guess I can't be here for very long because this is only my third job. Uh, <laughs> but I have no intention. You can let the dean know I have no intention of leaving, but I'll be a little bit, I'll bring those numbers down, I guess. Um, I was trained, uh, I'd sort of, I was raised, I should say, uh, first actually not so far from where Paul was, so just outside Rochester, New York. Um, I had a sort of nomadic educational career in Philadelphia, um, in Madison, Wisconsin, in Berkeley, and even in the wilds of northern New Jersey. Uh, and then have, uh, have been, again, Boston and now, uh, and now here. I was trained, actually also in a somewhat nomadic way, I was trained in both American and Russian history. And this is a little unusual for fields, that, for history is a field that really focuses on specificity and, and um, very narrow definitions of expertise, and then branched out actually and uh, have been working on India, history of American and Russia in, um, in India in the 20th century. I'm now doing a project on uh, research on global economic inequality and efforts to overcome it, and so some of the charts actually Jordan had up about the implications of public health and uh, environment are kinds of things that I would look at how how people from the global south, how economists from the global south were trying to solve. That's not what I'll be talking about uh, for my seminars. I have been involved in a number of teaching initiatives in Boston, mo both in US and global history, things at Brandeis, uh, at the John F. Kennedy Library, and the now departed but much beloved Teaching American History program uh, that uh, existed for um, the first decade of the 21st century. I'm grateful to have learned so much at these sessions. and. Um, Excited to be at Yale and excited for my initiation into the YNI. I had a plan originally for what I would say here, but after seeing the student projects yesterday, I kind of ditched it all and uh, starting over. So I'm going to offer two different uh, possibility of two different seminars, and we'll make a decision based on the discussions over the day and reflections afterward. Both are intended to find a way to kind of think together and learn together about new material and new approaches. Uh, they're designed mostly for uh, teachers of social studies, and I'm hoping also in uh, ELA, um, probably mostly for the uh, middle school and high school, but would be really excited to see how teachers of younger students um, could work with this as well. I'm describing both of the, I'll describe both of these seminars in very broad terms, and we'll narrow and pick precise readings once we see what kind of curriculum units um, uh, the teachers propose. Each are intended to address different challenges in the classroom. So if I turn to the first one, Cold War in Fact, Fiction, and Film, I'm looking at two different challenges. One is how to make complex global phenomena be more than just a march of events. Like how if you know, we teach the Cold War, it's of if this is 1962, it must be Cuban Missile Crisis. And these kind of broadly, these events that we kind of zip all over the, the, the globe in really disconnected ways. And so one of the things I'm interested in is how we can kind of consider those uh, together um, uh, and how to make events out there uh, out in the cult in, in international history and foreign relations connect to events here at home, right? There are lots of connections going both directions. I'd like to explore it. And both of those challenges about teaching the Cold War are also shaped by a third challenge, which is we're always teaching those in April and May. And uh, I've rarely, I'm always impressed with the teachers who aren't behind at that point in the semester, in the school year. And so uh, how do we make the most of the time uh, uh, to really, um, teach not just the events, but ways of thinking about it. So I'll offer in the, we'd offer in this two different ways of looking at the Cold War when we move beyond Moscow and Washington. Again, not just as Daniel said, a neutral objective march of events, but something to interpret and to reinterpret. Uh, we're gonna go both outward to the globe and inward to the relationship between geopolitics and American life. So I'll actually kind of go the other way as I talk about them. I'm gonna start with domestic, a kind of domestic approach and look at, um, 
The Cold War is part of battle over American politics and society. Watch the American society looks like what it should look like, and try and deal, among other things, with the paradox of trying to unite 1950s conformity, 1960s radicalism, uh, uh, and challenges to the status quo, both as Cold War phenomena. We'll explore links between social movements and the Cold War, most obviously the anti-war movement, but also Cold War civil rights, feminism, uh, student movements, and so on. We can show how our Cold War was a domestic conflict and not just an international one. We'll also look at how that international conflict affected uh, daily life, right? So um, these, again, these events out there, like the arms race, uh, an expanding system of mil military bases, both at home and abroad, uh, shaped domestic life. The rise of this military industrial complex created not just weapons, but it also created new kinds of cities new kinds of schools, new kinds of universities, new kinds of work, new kinds of knowledge. And we'll look at all of those as part of, uh, part of a kind of broader way to think about the Cold War. Depending on stu uh, student interest or teacher interest here, we'd look at um, uh, the great social movements of the 60s, uh, cultural Cold War from the CIA sponsorship of intellectuals to uh, the Cold War providing laboratories actually to oppose Cold War ideas, including things like ethnic studies, uh, the sort of forebear, I would take it to ERM, right? Uh, uh, which emerges out of, uh, as a kind of resistance to the Cold War from some of the same uh, programs. And these laboratories went, uh, included people from pastors to protesters as they did it. So that's the first way of looking inward domestically. A second is to see the Cold War as a domestic conflict about competing visions of the modern world. What does a just modern world look like? And it's, that's part of what's at stake in this conflict. And this is all the more important when we consider the other great tendency of the dozen or so years after World War II, decolonization. So for my generation, uh, educated in the last uh, decade of the Cold War, uh, the Cold War just looms so large as a defining feature of the 20th century. I think, um, if not in uh, the next, but then possibly the next generation, uh, it will be the era of decolonization, which the Cold War actually plays a much more um, uh, minor role. That's not where curriculum, uh, that's, that's not where our curricula are and common core requirements just now, so we have to adapt to that as well, but we can, we can set the stage for it. How the Cold War played out not just in the superpowers, not just in East and West Europe, but all around the world. How the combination of decolonization uh, and the Cold War created our world. We'll think about the terms that we use to understand the time, terms like Cold War itself, like the third world, um, uh, that really were laden with, uh, with assumptions and uh, meanings. So take the term Cold War, which is used to describe originally two opposing armies facing each other without shooting. Well, that's a pretty good description with a couple of stray shot, rifle shots here and there. It's a pretty good description of Europe, but it's a terrible description of much of the rest of the world, where the Cold War had lots of arms, lots of wars, uh, millions of lives involved in it, right? So we can look at this as a global conflict. We will look at the US-Soviet conflict, economic competition, the arms race, the division of Europe, which we can, uh, we can teach in many, way, <laughs> in many ways, including things like Bridge of Spies, uh, Korean War, Vietnam War, which I take as the hinge of the Cold War, at least in the American incarnation, looking at soldiers' accounts, uh, at some of the brilliant films of the, about Vietnam War and its effects, uh, novels by Tim O'Brien and many others. And in the larger sense, thinking about the U.S. role in, uh, in the global south, what was then the third world. We'll mix uh, historians' accounts with useful primary sources. Uh, we'll look at some great films with some films that we might generously say are period pieces. But hey, as historians, we want to understand those periods as well. Um, and we'll, we'll try and use that uh, to develop curricula as a framework to develop curricula uh, on the second half of the 20th century, both in US history and in world history. The second option uh, for a seminar, American History Through American Lives, takes on the challenge about how to teach about heroes and heroines, and in fact, how to teach about villains uh, in way that don't remove them from their own time and place. Right? As historians, we're very big on situating things in time and place. And somehow, uh, when we look at these heroes uh, and, and villains, we often um, sort of remove them uh, from that. And the second challenge, I think, is how to take a broad process, all these isations, industrialization, urbanization, modernization, and actually how to make them real. 
uh, for ourselves and for our students. And so using individual life stories uh, as, way, as a way to do that. So we can look at lives of the rich and powerful, Andrew Carnegie, John F. Kennedy, Reagan, Albright, uh, Madeleine Albright, Barack Obama, right? Bar Obama's a great example for this, right? A child of a US newly open to American, uh, to a, a kind of broader American power and broader American world uh, with roots in Kenya, with, tr uh, with upbringing in Indonesia, uh, with a childhood in America's newest and most diverse state. All of these ways are part and parcel of American history, not something that takes place outside it. We'll also look at the lives of insurgent leaders uh, to look at the ways that, we, that these offered challenges to the very hegemonic structures and hegemonic ways of thinking uh, that Dan talked about. Eugene Debs, Jane Addams, Rosa Parks, Betty for Dan, uh, right? Here, uh, take for instance Betty for Dan from an upwardly mobile Jewish family in Peoria to Queens, New York, uh, where she was an active journalist collected, uh, connected to progressive, actually even radical uh, trade unions before writing a book about white suburban unions, where she, uh, white suburban women, where she kind of forgot about her own uh, or kind of hid her own past when she wrote Feminine Mystique. We'll also look at the lives of unknown and unheralded immigrants, workers, migrants, soldiers. And I'm actually open to fictional lives as well uh, from uh, past lives, uh, from, from history, and even perhaps the future. So I think uh, of Sula, I think actually of June and Handmaid's Tale as, a, as someone we can use, use to understand uh, the 1980s. We'll spend time looking at exemplary biographies and, how to, and to think about how to teach them. I'll learn... Um, uh, we can compare notes on classroom experience. We can also think about um, how it is we can have small number of people carry big themes and help us answer big questions. We'll read um, some capsule biographies, but also some transmission belts, if you will, that get us from individual lives uh, to big picture. And again, we'll shake our, uh, shape our readings and discussions to uh, the individual curriculum plans people are, uh, people are working out. I mean, both seminars, I think, are designed to help us and to help our students uh, connect to broad historical phenomena and panoramas. History isn't just something out there uh, that we learn about it, but it's something that people make, right? Uh, even uh, big events like the Cold War are made in individual moments and have complex relationship between the individual and the history. Uh, it'll help uh, students understand, I hope, that they can, they can make that history of their own, on their own. And the greatest success of all would be to see our students featured as a subject in a future version of American history, American lives. Um, I'm excited for all this and look forward to working with you this year. Thanks.